Welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Although the number of COVID-19 cases is declining in most big cities, new coronavirus hotspots are cropping up along the rural countryside in areas that have been spared from large outbreaks until now. We know that you have concerns about the pandemic that are unique to rural America. So tonight we're going to give you a chance to get some answers straight from the experts who have been at the forefront of the crisis. 877-731-6733 is the number to call with your questions. Join the conversation tonight. We're answering those phones now. 877-731-6733. And joining us tonight from the University of Nebraska, Omaha, is world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And we also welcome a very special guest tonight, Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts also joins us. Thank you both for being here. We know how busy you are. Now, Dr. Gold, before we get to the numbers, you have some breaking news for us to begin with tonight. Yes, Christina, you know, as we've discussed uh, many times uh, on this show, and as I'm sure our audience knows, remdesivir, uh, the Gilead product, uh, has been quite successful uh, in reducing hospitalization in seriously infected individuals uh, with COVID-19 and with a very strong trend towards uh, actually enhanced survival. The announcement that uh, came out at least partially earlier today with more detail coming out from the National Institutes of Health in the next several days is that the second phase of the remdesivir trial, which is known as ACT-2, that's probably two out of four, two out of five, but ACT2 is a combination of remdesivir with a very potent anti-inflammatory agent called baricipamab. And the preliminary data shows that this combination in seriously ill patients with COVID-19 has both an important survival effect and also a shortening of hospitalization again. So again, this is a one-two punch because remdesivir is a specific antiviral agent. Baricipamab is an agent known as a JAK2 inhibitor that specifically targets inflammation in the lung, in the blood vessels, etc. And that combination of attacking the replication of the virus and reducing the inflammation seems to be really effective. And it goes directly to the data we're going to talk about in just a few minutes, uh, which is that in spite of the fact we're still seeing a significant number of cases across our country and even, of course, in rural America, the hospitalization rates and the death rates are continuing to be better controlled by these advantages in medicine. That is great news coming straight out of the heartland of this country, the University of Nebraska Medical Center, where our very own Dr. Gold is the chancellor. Let's start with an overview tonight. How widespread is COVID-19 across rural America? Well, Christina, since the last time we spoke uh, last week, the numbers continue to come down some. Uh, we're approximately 30 to 35,000 uh, new cases per day uh, across the United States. Of course, that puts us, as our first graphic shows, well over 6 million cases uh, in the United States, just over 6.5 million, and 194,000 deaths. Uh, again, uh, almost 2.5 million uh, confirmed recoveries, and I'm sure, frankly, there's a lot more than that. But if we look at the central part of the United States, specifically at the greater Midwest area, the Great Plains, uh, et cetera, uh, we see that there is continued and fairly rapid growth uh, in this part of the country. And unfortunately, a lot of that is actually on our college campuses. You know, we're looking at the impact of back to school uh, across our country, both in the K-12 schools, but equally and very importantly on the universities. And we'll have a chance to unpack uh, that a little bit later. The death rates, uh, uh, fortunately, do continue to fall. You know, I can recall not too long ago that on a national level, we were well over 2,000 deaths per day, and we're down to about a quarter of that now. We had a very uh, benign weekend. As you see, we had the uh, seven-day average peak early on uh, in mid-April for the number of new cases per day. We had another peak uh, in mid-July. And uh, we are plateauing uh, nationally, decreasing somewhat on the coasts, and staying fairly uh, constant uh, in our rural uh, farming and ranching communities. Our next graphic looks particularly at the death rates, and that will give us an opportunity to see that we did see a really early peak. But even though we've got a lot of a bump of cases over the summer, which is not unexpected as people get out and socialize and try to enjoy, a, you know, what I would call a more near-normal life, 
uh, the death rates went up, but they didn't go up as proportionately uh, as the total number of cases did. And that's attributable to two things. One, better care for patients. I think we understand how to keep them out of the ICU, how to keep them off ventilators, and how to get them out of the hospital. But secondly, as you know, Christine, and I'm sure the governor knows, we're seeing a big change in the age demographics. Early on, we were seeing 60, 70, and 80-year-old individuals in long-term care facilities and nursing homes. And now we're seeing a lot more uh, 35 to 55-year-old individuals. And in the last several weeks, uh, we're seeing a good number of college-age individuals who are younger and more resilient. They still get infected. They still spread the virus, but they don't end up in hospitals, and they fortunately don't end up uh, uh, demised. Now, this is a map of the United States that looks at the over 1,200 universities uh, in the United States and colleges that have reported uh, COVID cases uh, since the beginning of this fall semester, since the beginning of the school year. So this is not K-12 systems. The whole map would look red if we were looking at K-12 systems. But these are the large universities. And what you can see, uh, if you add this all up, there are somewhere between uh, 90 and 110,000 confirmed cases just of college-age individuals over the first several weeks. And this is not staff or, or faculty. This is just the students uh, that we're dealing with. And so the impact of this uh, is significant as the numbers uh, continue to rise. Now, a very interesting uh, fact, Christina, is that the spread does not appear to be in classrooms, doesn't appear to be in teaching labs or performance sites or, or even in athletic practice facilities. The predominant spread seems to be what happens on Friday and Saturday night, you know, after class is over and college students do what college students usually do, which is they enjoy an active social life. And unfortunately, some of that is without wearing their mask. Some of that is closer than six feet. Uh, and that's what we're really seeing across the United States. So the message uh, to our college-age students is they still need to be careful until we can get a vaccine out uh, in the near future. Absolutely. Governor Ricketts, strong governance is essential in a time of crisis. As you work to tailor an action plan that meets your state's specific needs, while trying to mitigate the impact on smaller populations right along with the big cities in your state, can you walk us through some of the tough decisions that you've had to make? Sure, thanks, Christina. One of the things that we tried to do here in Nebraska is really focus on how can we tailor the response to the area. So we have 19 local public health districts, and what we did is say, based upon as the virus is spreading, we were gonna make changes and put in directed health measures you know, restrictions on what people could do based upon how many cases people had. Mm -hmm. And the reverse has been true as well as, as we've been loosening restrictions. We've based it upon what's the on the ground conditions, working with local public health departments so we could really tailor it, understanding that maybe the same things we do in Lincoln and Omaha are not going to be the same for what it has to be in other parts of the state. And just, just to give you an example, if you look at Nebraska today, uh, fully a third of our counties have had three cases or less over the course of the last two weeks. And that's not three cases a day, that's three cases total over the course of the last two weeks. And, uh, you know, over 10 of them have had no cases over the last uh, two weeks. So we really do have to make sure we're not treating every county the same because the, the virus does not sp spread the same across our state. You know what I love is that the two of you have a bit of a history. When you visit Nebraska.gov under the office of Governor Pete Ricketts, there's a picture of you and Dr. Gold sitting side by side. Tell us a little bit about your relationship, especially how it's developed through this pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if I could jump in there, because yeah, it really has been a tremendous help having UNMC here as a resource for us here in Nebraska. Uh, our first briefings were folks from UNMC telling us about what was going to happen with regard to this virus, what it was going to look like. And that partnership has been just tremendously helpful to me as we've crafted our response here. And that picture that's on my website is actually, I think, one of the first briefings that we got yeah. with regard to what this virus is going to look like based upon the information from China. And so we really have tried to tailor our response based upon the information UNMC gave us. Uh, look at a lot, looking a lot at protecting our hospital system, which is really where we started this whole pandemic off, is really focused on making sure we can provide that hospital bed, that ICU bed, or that ventilator to anybody who would need it when they needed it. And uh, again, the UNMC has just been a tremendous resource. I, I can't say enough about how valuable it's been to have them here in Nebraska. Well, thank you for those very kind words, and uh, I would echo that. You know, uh, our first discussion, you may remember, occurred on a cold winter night. 
when we got a call from the federal government asked if we would start to repatriate American citizens from Wuhan. I remember you and I were on the phone together that night. And uh, not to say that we didn't work closely uh, previously, but uh, the communication between the university uh, and your office has been incredible. And I must tell you personally, I really appreciate it, Governor. It's been uh, it's a great opportunity for the university. But, it, you know, if you look at the numbers across the state of Nebraska, we still have one of the lowest mortality rates mm -hmm. of any state. We have, I think, the lowest hospital acquired COVID infection rates of our healthcare professionals. And a lot of that has to do with the training that the Med Center has uh, been able to uh, to have. And not to say we haven't had bumps in the road with a meatpacking facility there or a long-term care facility elsewhere. But uh, the communication, the collaboration, and the scientific-based decision-making has been incredible. Yeah, and actually, if I could just hop on that for just one more second. The, it's not a new thing either. So the UN, UNMC has been working with us with regard to our long-term care facilities for four years now to do infection control and really training our long-term care workers on how to prevent it long before this pandemic. So that has really been valuable for us to make sure that we haven't had the kind of impacts that have been seen in other sorts of states. And of course, the chancellor and I have each other's cell phone numbers and we've been on the phone anytime, day or night. Right. <laughs> Things All the up, time. Which also helps tremendously. Nebraska is the beating heart of this country in so many ways. The two of you are a big part of that. Our next viewer question comes from Howie of Illinois. He says, I would like to vote in person this year, but the vaccine may not be ready by then. What precautions should I take if I do cast my ballot in person? Well, why don't I start this, Governor, and then you can talk about your thoughts on the subject, because I think there are a lot of individuals that really care about that and would like to vote in person. It's my understanding that an incredible amount of precautions have been taken uh, for in-person polling and that the polling staff is being trained, everything from social distancing to the use of masks. And by the way, the governor and I are more than six feet apart tonight, which is how we can do this without our masks. Uh, but that uh, every precaution has been taken. And for some people, that, that will reassure them enough to come to the polls and to vote. And for others, uh, they're going to want to mail in their ballots. I mean, are there specific precautions or thoughts that you've had or that we're going to be putting into place here in Nebraska? I know we're going to mail uh, applications to every registered voter. Is that not right? Yeah, so in fact, that's already happened. So that we did that in the primary, and it'll happen in the general election here as well, that we will make sure everybody has that absentee ballot request form. And we've worked with the Secretary of State Office to make sure that all the poll workers will have the appropriate personal protective equipment, we're going to make sure, again, we have lines on the floor to keep people six feet apart. Everybody's going to be masked, gloves. We're giving everybody their own pen to fill out their ballot. So I would say, especially if you're here in Nebraska and you want to go to the polls, we'll be prepared to make sure that not only can you vote in person, but it'll be an experience that you can be confident that you'll be safe when you go do that because we've taken all the precautions to make sure that people can go vote in person. Though I would say that in the primary, we had 80% of the people actually vote uh, by mail the absentee yes. ballot. And uh, the, all this information, at least in Nebraska, is all online because I've actually gone to the Secretary of State's website and all of these precautions are very, very clearly outlined. So that would be my advice to, you know, people in other states. Do you, do you think, Governor, that this, this type of approach has been widely uh, employed across the country, or do you think Nebraska's ahead of the game in terms of the poll site safety? Well, I always think Nebraska's ahead of the game, but you, I, that you might got just me be my there bias. Too, right? <laughs> Particularly on Saturday <laughs> afternoons, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, you know, I know that our Secretary of State has been in contact with the other Secretaries of State with regard to how you do manage these elections. So I suspect that a lot of the precautions we're taking in Nebraska are being done in other states as well. All right. We are, thank you for straight answers there, by the way, because it's been really hard for us to get any straight answers as far as when do we know if it's going to be safe for us to vote in person. A lot of us want that comfort before November 3rd, so thank you for that. Now, Governor Ricketts, part of what you have worked to do while you've been in office is to cut unnecessary red tape to bolster Nebraska's businesses and to expand international markets for farmers and ranchers. Has that work been able to continue during the pandemic? So we certainly have experienced some challenges, just like any other state would have with regard to that international travel. So I'm kind of tackling your last part first. Uh, we haven't been able to do the trade missions that we would ordinarily do. And let me tell you, it, they make a big difference. Uh, you know, when I went to Vietnam last year, right before this pandemic, we had a Vietnamese delegation come to Nebraska and sign a memorandum of understanding to buy $3 billion of our, our ag products. 
And that's huge for our farmers and ranchers. So trade missions do work to promote your state. We haven't been able to do them, but we're going to pick them back up again next year. And with regard to cutting red tape and really being easy to do business with, I think you see that through the PPP program, the Paycheck Protection Program. Nebraska had one of the highest percentages of companies that were able to take advantage of that program. That helped us to be able to keep people employed. And all the other things we've done to be able to manage this virus while allowing people to live a more normal life has led Nebraska to be the least economically impacted state in the country. We've got the second lowest unemployment rate. And we continue to work on managing this so that we can allow people to return back to normal. And then that means, you know, being able to go back to work and uh, be able to take care of their families, which is so important for all of our families. Yeah, we all want to be able to plan for the future right now. Our next viewer question comes from Bill in Georgia. He has a question about how COVID-19 cases are counted by the federal government. Let's listen. Uh, I know someone who had three positive tests before they finally got their negative test back. Do those three positive tests they took count as three cases in the total counts that get released each day? Uh, well, Bill, uh, they shouldn't. Uh, I can tell you what we do in Nebraska is we work really, really hard to do what's called deduplication. I think that's the phrase that I've heard from uh, Tom Safranik that uh, whether they're point of care tests or whether they're laboratory tests, anything that comes into the registry is looked at and, uh, and personal, identif personal identification information is used to be sure that we're not reporting one individual three times. Is, is that your understanding? Yeah, that's absolutely right, uh, Dr. Gold. And, and in fact, Bill, you hit upon something that's actually a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. We had a disagreement with the White House with regard to how they were reporting our data because we provide them data through a couple different data streams and they were not deduplicating the data as Chancellor Gold was talking about here. And so they were, in a sense, double counting some of the cases we had here. Mm -hmm. And you may ask, how can that happen? Well, for example, if we have somebody from a long-term care facility in the hospital, they've got to get a negative test before they can go back to their long-term care facility. And that may mean they may get three or four positive tests before they get that negative test. And to your point, Chancellor, that shouldn't count as more than one person. But the federal government was reporting that in our data at the national stats for Nebraska that way. And so we've been working with the White House to try and get that fixed and corrected because you're right, here in Nebraska, we don't report it that way. Yeah, so the data we use is clean data. All right. Thank you so much for that call. 877-731-6733. That leaves a line open for you tonight. I'm going to give that number to you one more time before we go to break. 877-731-6733. We have not talked about vaccines yet, but we will after the break. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Joining us tonight, Governor of Nebraska, Pete Ricketts. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, and special guest, Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts joins us tonight as well. Now, Governor Ricketts, you had a chance to deal with the weight of keeping all of Nebraska's communities safe. You've done a great job of it as this unknown virus moved in. I'm sure, though, you've had some concern for your family as well during this time. Has the virus impacted you personally in any way? Well, certainly like all Nebraska families, we've had to change the things we do with regard to how we go about our lives. Uh, for example, my mom has pretty much been confined to her house with very limited excursions outside her home because she's older, has some underlying health care conditions and so forth. And of course, that puts her at more risk than, say, uh, a 22-year-old might be. So that's a, an impact there. And actually, right early on in this pandemic, one of my very good friends in New York, uh, one of my best friends from college, got it and got a very severe case. He had a fever of over 100 degrees for uh, well, actually 104 degrees for 11 days. Mm -hmm. wow. uh, and even after he recovered, was still, it was out of breath just taking his dog for a walk. So I, I have had friends who have gotten it. Some have weathered it pretty well. Some have been severely impacted. And so I think that every person on the face of this has probably got some sort of story of someone they know personally who has had the coronavirus. Absolutely, which is why a vaccine is so important. Dr. Gold, can we talk about the latest updates with vaccines? Sure. Well, why don't we start with the numbers and the vaccine tracker data just to set the stage, and then we can talk a little bit more about it. And I understand the last White House briefing was specifically on warp speed and vaccine production, so we'll get the best from the governor as well. But <clears throat> currently, uh, there are 
uh, 39 vaccines in either phase one or phase two safety testing around the world. Now, of course, phase one and phase two are both just safety testing, they're not efficacy testing. Phase three is the opportunity to test in large numbers of population, typically aimed at at least 30,000 people. 15,000 get a placebo, 15,000 get the actual vaccine. These are all now using two doses, about three weeks apart of the vaccine. Uh, and uh, there are nine companies uh, in that stage. The three leaders uh, at the moment are AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Moderna. And they're all different types of vaccines. They all have different manufacturing capabilities, shipment capabilities, administration requirements, etc. Now, as the audience probably knows, last Tuesday, uh, there was a major announcement by AstraZeneca uh, to pause their clinical trial. And it was based upon the reporting of a second neurological event that occurred uh, in one of the uh, volunteers that received the vaccine. Now, that type of thing does happen in a trial this large of 30,000 people. And it's very important for the audience to understand that that's exactly why we do these trials. I mean, if we were not able to identify unusual uh, reactions to either the vaccine or to random occurrence <clears throat> and then make a safety decision as to continue the trial or not continue the trial, that would be a, you know, there's no purpose of doing the trial. Uh, and so it just demonstrates the fact that the science is, prevail is prevailing, that the data safety board that oversees, in this case, the AstraZeneca product, uh, which is an adenovirus-mediated uh, so-called transfected product, uh, was safe. And they reestablished the trial, I believe that early this morning, I read, uh, at least in Great Britain, the, the trial has been ongoing. So we're now very privileged here in Nebraska in that we are actually going to be participating in a number of these trials. Uh, fortunately, as the governor knows, uh, we're not the prime site for these trials because the number of cases we have is relatively small compared to other parts of the country. So that's sort of, uh, would, while it would be nice to run the trials, it's a kind of a compliment to not be looked at as, a, as the trial epicenter for the largest number. So uh, why don't I ask the governor now to share with us what he can from the most recent White House briefing on uh, warp speed. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Because one of the things we do is we have weekly uh, press briefings with the White House for all the nation's governors. And at the last one, they focused entirely on Operation Warp Speed and talked to us about just the things you were talking about, Chancellor. So, for example, uh, two of the uh, three drugs that are the furthest into phase three have already recruited 20,000 people as far as the test subjects. Uh, to be able to go through this. They emphasized they were going to focus on the safety. Uh, obviously, one of the things we won't know is the long-term effects, but everything else with regard to the safety will be there with regard to how they do these trials. Uh, we were also asked to really prepare our vaccination plans by November 1st to be able to get ready for this. Uh, we may have to be able, to, for example, to transport vaccines that are either refrigerated, frozen, or super cold, minus 60 to 80 degrees Celsius. So they want us to be prepared to be able to handle all three of these types of vaccines. And then, of course, uh, two of the three are also two doses, which means you get them two to four weeks apart, which means we have to do a lot of great tracking with regard to who got the vaccine and why. And that's one of the things the White House is really focused on is making sure we've got good data management to know who is all getting this, that we're, they're really doing a good job of tracking this vaccine, because, of course, this is really how we uh, really break through what we're in right now with regard to the transmission. And, you know, I'm really pleased that the National Institutes uh, of Health in combination uh, with the Academy of Medicine, has rolled out what I think to be a very reasonable prioritization for the sequencing of the distribution of the vaccines. And I, I think the combination of the NIH, the CDC, and the Academy of Medicine is going to produce a very rational approach that we can embrace, you know, looking at older, more vulnerable individuals, looking at health care providers, looking at long-term care facilities, uh, to be sure that those that need it the most get it first. Absolutely. All right. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. We're going to go to the phones and welcome Evan. Thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead from Alaska. So uh, my question is around CRISPR-Cas9 uh, therapies. And I know ag business is really in the forefront of using this technology to help uh, get more beef production, help get more 
uh, wheat production, corn production, soybean production. And so I'm wondering if the University of Nebraska has been able to leverage, you know, that deep knowledge in assisting with virus therapies. Evan, you know, uh, right in our wheelhouse, uh, we happen to be one of the largest centers in the country using CRISPR-Cas9, or what is currently known as uh, Easy CRISPR, which is a modification of CRISPR-Cas9. And we've applied this to everything from cancer care to some recent work we've done on HIV, and most recently, as you're pointing out, to uh, COVID-19. Uh, we actually believe that some of the genetic work and what CRISPR-Cas9 does for the uh, audience that may not be familiar uh, with the term, which I wasn't until fairly recently, it's the ability to take a pair of scissors, slice out a piece of DNA or RNA, and then replace it uh, with, a, with a different gene. So for instance, uh, cystic fibrosis would be a really good example, or sickle cell disease our audience may have read about. These are all genetically determined diseases and we found a way through the use of CRISPR-Cas9 therapy to selectively remove the defective piece of gene sequence and replace it with a normal gene sequence. And indeed, amazingly, uh, you can cure people uh, for the rest of their lives. Same thing has been true on some of the genetic work, uh, particularly the monoclonal antibody development work for COVID-19. And a lot of that is coming directly out of our CRISPR labs uh, here at the Med Center. Uh, in collaboration with a number of academic medical centers across the country. So, Evan, you're, you're right on. I mean, this type of technology was not available just a few short years ago and now is absolutely transformational. You think about the potential for gene editing, how far we've come with agriculture. I cannot even imagine how great it must be to be in your field right now with all this promise ahead of you. Governor Ricketts, as we go into this period of economic contraction, what are some of the most challenging parts of budgeting right now for the various needs in your state? Well, one of the things that we've seen here in Nebraska, because we've been the least economically impacted state, is we actually finished up our fiscal year, which ended June 30th, with that surplus. We were actually able to add money into our rainy day fund. And while we did, as we went through the budgeting process for the next fiscal year, which began July 1st, cut about 1% out of our budget, you know, anybody ought to be able to take a look at their budget and cut 1% and be able to manage it. And frankly, what we have seen so far is that our revenues have been very healthy as we go through this. So we're cautiously, cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to meet our revenue forecast for this fiscal year. Now, of course, the question then remains what's going to happen to the years that follow. But this is why we really have to strike that balance between managing the virus and allowing people to go back to a more normal life. And that it hits upon the things I said about Nebraska being the least economically impacted state, having the second lowest unemployment rate. That all contributes to being able to make sure that as people go back to work, uh, our state tax revenues will be in line with that and will be able to continue to provide the important services that we provide at the state of Nebraska. Yeah, as far as governors go in states, you're actually, when it comes to this pandemic, you are one of the shining stars. The state of Nebraska has shown us a lot of good qualities that we can all live up to. Next up, we have Mark of Texas, and he says, my brother and I are third generation Angus breeders. We're very careful about worker safety, but concerned about the cost of PPE. How long do you think we'll need to provide masks, sanitizer and disinfectant for our crews? Yeah, Mark, I think uh, I would plan for at least the next several months, uh, and uh, let's see what the story turns out to be with the vaccines. You know, uh, there's a lot of discussion about when the vaccines are actually going to be available. The governor talked about shipping uh, as early as uh, the beginning of November, uh, and I certainly hope that that's true. But at the end of the day, in order to get herd immunity for COVID, uh, we're going to have to immunize something north of 200 million Americans. And I'm um, sure as the governor knows, and, uh, and as you know, uh, Mark, uh, this is not going to happen overnight. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work. You know, if you look at flu immunization patterns, uh, it typically takes a good three to four months. And by the way, in case the audience is wondering what this little sticker on my coat says, it says that I got my flu vaccine today. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about why that's so important. But I got immunized uh, earlier today and I'm trying to get our entire team, uh, the entire university healthcare delivery team immunized early and directly uh, as well. And by the way, that's a video of uh, me getting my flu shot. 
uh, at the Med Center earlier today, uh, thanks to our, uh, our really best uh, videographers. I actually survived that uh, with uh, no <laughs> discomfort at all uh, and uh, went on uh, to strongly advocate that, uh, that this would be a really good time uh, for folks to, to get their vaccine. You see, uh, here I am several hours later and I'm still alive and well. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, in, in terms of your in direct answer to your question about PPE, first of all, I think it is more plentiful and it is more affordable, and the governor can comment on that. But I think I'd recommend that you stock up until your entire team and, more importantly, your community has had an adequate amount of the vaccine and we know for a fact that it's not only safe, of course, but that it's enduring in its factor. Do you have a feeling, Governor, that the uh, PPE availability is starting to loosen up? I'm hearing less about it, you know, these days. Yeah, it certainly is a challenge getting PPE, uh, especially specifically N95 masks, which are the ones that healthcare workers prefer. Uh, Honeywell, for example, is making a supply of those, and we've got our first deliveries of the state of Nebraska coming in. In the meantime, you can use the KN95 mask that the FDA has approved, CDC has tested. So, Mark, I suggest you use those, and I would agree with you, Chancellor. We're probably talking through the first quarter of next year as you think about, you know, what does it take to get 200 million people uh, vaccinated? So I think if you're thinking about planning for your business, really be thinking about, I've got to be planning for this for at least the next six months. And, you know, Governor, one of the things I've learned from uh, working with our farmers and ranchers is a lot of them uh, actually use K95s and, and N95 masks as well just because of dust particles and things like that that they deal with as a routine part of their farming and ranching business. So they probably have a supplier uh, of that, and hopefully it'll become uh, more and more available. Uh, I'd also say to continue to recycle them. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, uh, with Dr. John Lowe several weeks ago the opportunity uh, to reuse N95s, plastic masks, of course, cloth masks are reusable. And so this is a good time to conserve them and make sure that you'll have them, I would say, at least through the first quarter, uh, if, if not even to the, uh, you know, mid-spring of next year. Wow. Okay. Governor Ricketts, you are the commander-in-chief of the Nebraska National Guard. Talk about the role that they've played throughout the pandemic so far and the role they may step into possibly when it comes to vaccines. Yeah, I could not be more proud of the Nebraska National Guard. They've really just done a fantastic service for the state of Nebraska as citizen soldiers. And, of course, that was true when we had the flooding last year in Nebraska, the worst natural disaster, the most widespread that we've had in our state's history. And uh, their role through this pandemic has been to provide testing, which has been vital for us as we've been rolling that out in mobile testing sites across the state and then got that squared away with a lot of our health care providers. And then also making key deliveries of uh, PPE and other types of issues that they were going to need. So the National Guard really have just been my hero throughout this and all of our disasters, but in particular this pandemic, they've been vitally helpful, providing logistical support, uh, management support, again, delivering supplies, doing testing. Uh, we can all be very, very proud of our men and women in the Nebraska National Guard and all the National Guards across the country because they've been doing the same thing in every other state they've been doing here in Nebraska. And, you know, there's a discussion, Governor, that in some states, at least, that the National Guard may be helpful in terms of either distributing the vaccines or actually even some of them administering some of the vaccines. So I think we're just going to have to see how that plays out over time. Absolutely. All right. This is a tough one, but since I have the two of you on one panel, I have to ask masks they have been touted as an effective public health tool but they're also a hot button political issue with many rural americans how do you reconcile this in nebraska and what sort of guidance do you have for the rest of the country well why don't i start and uh, the governor and i can uh, share this <laughs> if that's okay uh, I, you know, the, so just just to talk science for a minute uh there is no question that there are a small number of individuals for medical reasons who should not wear a mask. They either have significant air disease or they have some type of facial deformity as a result of an accident, cancer surgery, et cetera, that makes it impossible. That is a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of people. For all of the rest of us, there is no doubt scientifically that masks not only stop you from spreading your germs, all of your germs, whether it's influenza, COVID, uh, the common flu, doesn't make any difference to other people. And with also, without a doubt, it keeps you from inhaling droplets 
uh, that are spread in the airways from other individuals. We know, without a shadow of a doubt, that COVID is not only a droplet infection, but that it spreads through tiny little particles that linger in the air. And whether it's a cloth mask, a paper mask, an N95 respirator, uh, it, it is unquestionably uh, important to use this type of facial protective equipment, maintain six foot distancing, sanitize surfaces, etc. Now, the question, though, uh, Christina, is how do you get the best out of people? How do you motivate them to really not only understand, but to actually use a mask? And that's where I think a lot of this controversy comes up. I mean, do you say you are forced to wear a mask, as we are, are here in Omaha? We have a mask ordinance here. Do you try to tell college students, for instance, it would be to your best interest to wear a mask? You know, I've had college-age kids. The governor does as well. Uh, we all know what that's like. So that's where I think the art comes in and has to rub up against the science. So do you have thoughts about the art of this, Governor Ricketts? Yeah, absolutely, because that's, this is a real question for all of us who are policymakers. And that's where I agree 100 percent with what Chancellor Gold was saying that, look, masks work. They're one of the tools that we have to be able to slow the spread of the virus here in our country and in Nebraska in particular. So what we want to do is really teach people how to use that tool, along with the other ones he mentioned as well, staying six feet apart from people, washing your hands often, avoid crowded bars and restaurants. All those things will help us slow the spread of the virus. My approach has been not to mandate. I'm against mandates because I believe mandates breed resistance. But to really work to educate people. And, and here, Nebraskans, they're going to do the right thing. If you give them the reason for why, teach them how to do it, they're going to do the right thing. And it's, but it's also the kind of thing that it's not going to happen overnight. I, I walked into one meeting in a rural community, and I was the only one wearing a mask. And I went to the organizer and said, hey, you know, you guys heard this pandemic thing? It's in all the papers. <laughs> He's like, well, do you want us to wear masks? I said, well, here's the deal. Should anybody in this meeting come down with coronavirus, I won't have to quarantine, but everybody else will. Now, what decision do you want to make here? And so we started seeing more people putting on their masks. And I think that's what we have to do is just not try to be heavy handed with this, but really try to educate people about what's the benefit of wearing a mask. Again, if you can avoid being quarantined or if it allows you to get your school open and to have kids in the classroom and not have the whole class be quarantined. Because, How about play football or play football, for example? Yeah, it's a right. great example. That's a that's a great opportunity to be able to why people should use masks. In fact, it's one of the things that I've said in my press briefings. I've said, hey, if you want to see football this fall, follow our social distancing rules, including wearing masks and being six feet apart. That will help us to be able to get to where you want to be. And we want to we, where we all want to be. Yeah, I've seen you post that very sentiment on Twitter, and I appreciate seeing that. You know, you are a Republican governor right in the heartland, so to see you talking about masks, it really does mean something to rural America. We appreciate that. We're going to pause for a moment. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts joins us tonight. Our next viewer question comes from George and Joanne Franklin. They ask, we watch your program from rural Arkansas and would like to know, can you get the virus more than once? Yeah, so, you know, there's been a lot written about that and there have been a number of individuals who would absolutely tell you that they've had the virus twice. But when you look at the science of that, you get a somewhat different answer. Uh, and, uh, and that's because, first of all, there are a number of individuals that are what are referred to now as long haulers. And by that, what I mean by that is they get the virus, their symptoms get worse, their symptoms get better, they did never completely recover. Then they get another test about a month later. They test positive and they say, aha, I've got the virus again. Then there have been a number of other people who uh, get the virus, recover completely, uh, go back to work, go back to school, whatever. And then uh, several weeks or months later, fever, cough, shortness of breath, etc., tested positive, uh, and lo and behold, up, I've got the virus again. It turns out, though, that when you look really, really carefully, that they may never have actually stopped shedding virus, that they may just be not symptomatic, but a carrier of the virus. So there are a small number 
of anecdotal uh, experiences <clears throat> where individuals were infected, cleared the virus completely, looked well, felt well, went back to work, church, school, whatever, uh, and then several months later got reinfected. It's not clear whether that's the exact same strain of COVID-19, a slightly different genetic version of COVID-19, or whether they actually never completely cleared it, but their, quote, negative test wasn't really negative. You know, unfortunately, uh, while we like to trust our tests, they're not perfect. There are a number of false negatives, and there's a small number of false positives as well. And so I would say, uh, George and Joanne, that the chance of getting it again is extremely unlikely, uh, but that it's probably not impossible as we see some uh, genetic shift over a period of time. The good news is, is that the vaccines that are being developed are broad enough in their approach that even for the minor genetic shifts that we've been seeing across the country and around the world, they're likely going to cover these genetic transformations, so-called mutations, that the viruses are having, which is a really good uh, thing for all of us because it would be kind of sad if we all got immunized and then six months later <laughs> the virus mutates and, you know, we're back to the beginning of this cycle all over again. Oh, we do not want to hear that even potential for that to happen, but we appreciate you sharing that research. We're going to go back to the phones. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. Clayton from Tennessee is up next. Thanks for joining us, Clayton. Go right ahead. Hi, guys. Uh, I was diagnosed with COVID last week and was told when I got my results back that I needed to isolate for only 10 days when I had heard this 14 days to stop the spread. You know, you, you've got it for two weeks. Um, and on the note of what you were just talking about, they said that I don't need to worry about coming back in to be tested for negative because I could have it even for a couple of months. I could still be getting positive tests. So am I not contagious after only 10 days or could it be that now that I'm about a week into this, that I may not be contagious now? Uh, first of all, Clayton, uh, you sound darn good to me. You don't sound at all short of breath. And, uh, and you're asking a really, really critically uh, important question. So the current CDC recommendation is 14 days. And uh, there are a number of parts of the country where so-called essential workers, healthcare workers, uh, food service workers, others, uh, are quarantined and isolated for a lesser period of time and only if they're isolated for a lesser period of time would they have to test negative. But you're exactly right. You know, going back to the days of the Diamond Princess, we tested people who were clearly infected on the Diamond Princess, as the governor knows, who were looking well, feeling swell, completely asymptomatic, who tested positive for six or eight weeks uh, after they were uh, infected. And yet uh, it's unclear whether you could actually spread the virus or not. So the current recommendations that we use here 14 days, no need for a follow-up test unless you remain symptomatic at that 14-day period. If you're still significantly short of breath or having fever or still congested or any of the other COVID-related symptoms, uh, that's, a, that's a time to call your healthcare professional. You probably need to be retested, but you probably also need to be seen because uh, there are some later effects of covid particularly some of the heart and vascular effects that we talked about on one of our earlier shows uh, that you might want to be tested for. But otherwise, 14 days, uh, you should be looking well, feeling swell, and be able to get on with your life. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Clayton. We appreciate it. Governor Ricketts, I read a headline today that said Florida's rural real estate is booming during the pandemic. Have you noticed any sort of a surge of people at least looking around for property in parts of rural Nebraska? Well, I have not got any data with regard to that, but I can tell you certainly just anecdotally, I hear all sorts of stories about people moving from the coast to Nebraska. Generally, they have a connection or sometimes they don't because of the things that they've been experiencing on the coast with regard to the lockdowns and so forth. And, you know, obviously I'm biased here as the governor of Nebraska. I think we got the best quality of life anywhere in the country right here in my state. But it certainly is true that we are not having the same sort of restrictions that you have in places like the coast or Chicago or someplace like that. So uh, while I've got anecdotal stories of people, I don't have any data I can share you to the, that would for sure say, yeah, people are moving to rural Nebraska because of the great quality of life. 
I believe that, but I, I just don't have any data I can prove it. Well, you know, Christine, I can tell you that we continue at the Med Center to recruit constantly throughout the duration of the pandemic. And the number of individuals that we are now recruiting from the coasts is probably at an all-time high. And as uh, many of them are moving uh, to uh, Nebraska, particularly to eastern Nebraska, to the greater Omaha metro uh, area, uh, I had uh, you know, a meeting with one of them just recently, and they told me that the housing market is extremely tight uh, here in, in this part of the state. And, you know, I still have a lot of friends and family on the, on the coast, on the east coast, and they tell me that the number of people that are moving out of the inner cities out into some of the uh, suburban communities, because and by the way, working from home, is also at an all-time high. Somebody told me that some of the moving companies are not taking new customers anymore, wow. which is, you know, when was the last time we saw a moving company or a real estate company not take new customers? <laughs> you know, uh, so uh, I would say, uh, you know, there's some uh, likelihood that that is, is correct. In the midst of a sharp economic downturn, nonetheless, that is surprising to me. But you have to wonder, do they want to learn from the best, Dr. Gold? Or maybe they just want to live in a beautiful part of the country, rural Nebraska. Tim from Wyoming say says... Both. <laughs> A little bit of both. I know I would want to learn from you because you are so good at just breaking it down to layman's terms. Tim from Wyoming says, if the economy doesn't turn around and more rural hospitals go bankrupt, do you think we'll end up with more health care deserts and have to travel even further for medical treatment? You know, I think the jury's out on that, Tim. And of course, we'll let the governor reflect on that important question in just a minute. Uh, I think that some of the federal stimulus dollars that have been provided have helped our rural hospitals, and you know we've been working very hard with them as well. But there's also no question, Tim, that there's a big shift to telehealth, and that a lot of the larger academic medical centers across the country, such as ours, are delivering hundreds, maybe even a thousand times more telehealth uh, services, uh, which people are... Uh, not only just accepting, but actually enjoying. If we look at, you know, we measure patient satisfaction on every single interaction. And a lot of what used to take, a, you know, a three-hour car ride from rural Nebraska for a 30-minute checkup for Parkinson's or, you know, a follow-up cardiac scan or, or cancer uh, can be safely done in, in rural communities. So I think the, the jury is out as to what the viability is going to be of our rural community hospitals and our critical access hospitals. You have thoughts on that, Governor Ricketts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, the critical access hospitals are really fundamental for us to be able to provide that uh, care in rural Nebraska. And so that is one of the things that we pay attention to. Uh, kind of short term, I think you're exactly right. The federal stimulus has been absolutely critical to helping out our hospitals. We've heard that time and time again about that money really helping hospitals stay open. One of the things we did here in Nebraska that also other states did was we temporarily ceased those elective surgeries, and that had a huge impact on our rural hospitals. So we wanted to release that restriction as quickly as possible. In fact, that was our first restriction we did release because we knew it was having such an economic impact on our rural hospitals as well. So, uh, but I think that generally, as we get through this phase of the pandemic, we're pretty good on that. We gotta continue to manage it. But I, I do think you make up a great point though with regard to if the market is changing because of telehealth, we got to make sure we're working with our rural hospitals to be able to provide that value-added proposition so they continue to be there for folks in rural Nebraska and elsewhere around the country. And it is going to be an ongoing issue for us to be able to manage that. And it even sometimes comes down to, you know, the broadband issue, you know, the so-called last mile of broadband where, you know, not every single rural community has the same type of access uh, to telehealth, telebanking, you know, you know, accounting and all sorts of other types of uh, important services. So uh, it's, it's definitely a work in progress. And actually, uh, that's one of the reasons why as part of our CARES Act money, what we did is we set aside money for about $40 million for rural broadband to do that last mile connection so that we could expand that to make sure that whether it's working from home or education or health, that those rural households will have that ability to do it. That's uh, great to hear. I, I know that a lot of people want to hear more about rural broadband being expanded, especially in really remote places in the country. Let's talk a little bit about what's happening when it comes to job loss. I think that all of us at this point, not only do we know somebody who was impacted significantly by COVID-19, many of us also know somebody who lost a job during this time. 
What can states do for those who have been affected economically by this pandemic, either through a loss of job or business downturn? Well, let me just start, Christina, if you don't mind, just to say that uh, we have been incredibly fortunate uh, in our medical centers and that we've been able to retain the workforce uh, and no one has really lost their jobs or very few. Uh, there are some folks that took some time off. There are some folks that were furloughed. There are some folks that went from full time to part time. And a lot of that had to do with child care needs, uh, care of uh, elders in their homes. Uh, others had to do it because of uh, coronavirus itself, meaning they themselves were sick and were recovering, et cetera. But we were able to use our workforce in a very creative way. And when the governor uh, released the uh, ability to do elective surgery, we dealt with a huge backlog of individuals, which we're dealing with now. But I think what the audience wants, Governor, is more of a 50,000-foot view of, uh, of what's really going on with jobs. Yeah, absolutely. This is where we've really you know, worked to strive to balance slowing the spread of the virus to protect our hospital capacity, but also let people return to a more normal life, which means going back to work. And so we have put together a number of different uh, programs to be able to help small businesses. And, of course, some of them were the federal ones, like the PPP, which our community banks did a phenomenal job of working for companies to, to be able to get that. We also took the CARES Act money we received from the federal government to create uh, a fund to be able to help companies recover, either through direct grants of $12,000 apiece, and not just for small businesses, but also our livestock producers. And we took it down to one-person operations. Uh, but we also put in a program to provide $16 million for continuing education to get, say, an updated certificate if your job had been impacted by COVID. Uh, we uh, put aside that $40 million we talked about already. And then, of course, we've done things with regard to the pandemic unemployment fund that the federal government offered to extend it $300. We've, we've done that. But we've also really encouraged people to go back to work. So, for example, with our SNAP program, we've got a program called SNAP Next Step, which is basically taking our job coaches from the Department of Labor offer them to our families on SNAP to help them get a better job so they can reduce their reliance on SNAP. And so that's another way that we've helped people get back to work here in the state of Nebraska. We offer job coaches to anybody, not just people who are unemployed, but anybody can have access to those resources to create a better resume, get help on looking for a better job and that sort of thing so we can really take the best advantage of everybody we have here in Nebraska. And frankly, this is one of the reasons why we have the second lowest unemployment rate and the least impacted economy. Ah, we'd love to see that spread across the nation. I want to thank you both so much for being with us. Dr. Gold, do you have any final thoughts for our audience tonight? Yeah, Christina, I think uh, while the news is good on vaccine development, the news is good on this new antiviral breaking story that's coming out. We still can't lose focus on the only things that we can do every day, and that is wear masks, social distance, uh, take care of each other. I think we are turning the corner on some of these medical issues, but this is a time to be extra vigilant for the next several months. And you've got that sticker on. You had your flu shot. Might be time for the rest of us to get ours as well. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Nebraska Department, <sighs> Nebraska Department, Nebraska Governor, the Governor of Nebraska, Pete Ricketts. Thank you so much for joining us as well. We know how busy the two of you are. We know your commitment to curing this virus and helping us all get back on our feet economically as well. So thank you so much for the work that you do for this great country. Remember, you can catch more Rural Health Matters every Monday, 6 Eastern, 5 Central. If we didn't get to your question tonight, you can leave us a voice recording on our hotline. That number is 855-776-6147. Good night from Rural America's most important network.